So guys, we're open gear. Um, I'm gonna, does anyone want any literature or you want to read all online? You want to carry oh, sure. There you go. Yep. So I'm going to have uh, Rick Stevenson, our CEO, give a little intro about the company to those who didn't see us at Tech Field Day or Network Field Day 4 um, in October. And uh, we'll let Rick tell you a little bit about the history of the company. This is a new product yeah, that I'm passing out. This is our newest platform that we're introducing today. Awesome. You want my card and you know what I'm doing. Yep, I'll start while you're doing that. So I'm Rick Stevenson. Uh, I used to be a, a Unix kernel hacker, but for about 10 years now I've had plenty, plenty hair. So I'm the, the CEO of the company and I just want to tell you a little bit about our history. So uh, OpenGear was started by a group of people, the core group who'd worked before at a couple of previous ventures. So our previous one was a company called Snapgear that did uh, security appliances. It was uh, acquired by a company called CyberGuard in 2003 and uh, ended up as part of McAfee before it disappeared without trace. So we decided to do something new once we sold the company and um, we had skills in leveraging open source to build products. Uh, participated in a bunch of open source projects as well, of course. And uh, we knew how to build cost-effective appliances, so we, I guess we kind of looked at our skills and tried to decide what to do next. And uh, we decided to attack the, the console server market and uh, secure remote management. And, uh, so we basically did the same thing we've done two times before, but uh, gave it a slightly different swing. So what we're about is um, secure remote management. These days, systems are more and more complex. And that's been happening for years, uh, and less and less reliable. And uh, you're expected to maintain them with fewer and fewer resources and less and less money. And of course, the cost of failure is higher and higher. So uh, since you can't do 5.9's reliability anymore, we decided that the best solution was to uh, give you a way to find and fix things when they, when they went wrong really quickly. So uh, what we really do is out of band. So a device like this, you can connect it to uh, all of your network gear, you can connect it to physical sensors, environmental sensors, and uh, you can get in when the network goes down, you can fix the configuration of the router, you can reboot things, you can uh, manipulate power systems, and you can do that typically over a cellular interface or, or modem if you really want to, but these days everybody does cellular. So uh, they're the, the sort of devices we make. Um, embedded Linux, um, open source inside if you want, you can play with them. You can use the, the CDK to build your own applications, your own protocols and things. Um, and today we're announcing a new product, which is this big red thing. And uh, Jared's going to talk about that. Thanks, Rick. So we're going to pass around some of these products you guys can take a closer look. Um, these product families, the IM7200 is the newest one that we're launching today. It's a larger version of the smaller form factor products that can be found in a data center or a remote location. These are all cellular enabled out of band management solutions. Why don't you pass them around? That one's an LTE right there. Um, they all have the same features and capabilities. This one exceeds it by a little bit because it has um, both internal Wi-Fi access point, uh, 4G cellular LTE that gives you end-to-end -end wireless connectivity. Now one of the ways that you would use this is to uh, link up to remote Wi-Fi sensors in a data center, a little battery powered, water leak detection, door contact sensors. You have full wireless capability and, and access and visibility now out of band. So even if there's a problem with the network, you can still get in over LTE or 4G on a secure connection. Um, these devices have 16, 32, or 48 serial ports in the rear of the unit. They're pinned out to be plugged directly into Cisco equipment with a straight through Cat5 cable. This one's unique because it can be software selectable to flip to rolled. So if you have existing cabling, you can flip flop per port uh, to make it easy for installation. It also has an LCD on the front that'll show you uh, IP address, any type of diagnostics coming across it as well. Um, so it's our newest platform. The reason why we built it was based on customer requests. We had people that wanted more horsepower to do advanced console management software and integrate uh, software that's firing off multiple SSH sessions simultaneously, like upwards of 50 to 100 instantaneously. Our prior platform couldn't handle 100 SSH tunnels fired at it simultaneously. This product can. So it has a one gigahertz processor, 16 gig of onboard flash, and it's expandable for, um, with an SD card. How much memory? It comes with 16 gig. So, so you can expand. RAM and memory? Or RAM and disk? Or? Uh, that's 
that's flash. But you can expand it with an SD card. Okay. Thank you, Rick. And so you can store um, offline logs, running config files, or full iOS on it. It does have a built-in modem as well. So if you had an installation where you had a POTS line you wanted to dial into it, you could keep your um, your local iOS as uh, on this as a TFTP or FTP server as a repository. So if you had to dial in and flash something from bare metal, uh, you could do it over a slow POTS line with having a local copy. So this is our new product. Uh, any questions so far? So more horsepower. So I remember last time we were talking, you have some interesting but non-technical use cases of salmon, salmon counting, right. which is really neat. Uh, <laughs> the the real-world use cases of, OK, out of the back of our kind of a, uh, pods and racks and using that for uh, out-of-band management and configuration of uh, the network and systems components, being able to like proxy the IP addresses back for the IP management. Um, one of the things that came up in the discussion was uh, Puppet Master support and Chef support. Um, and so you talked about in the, in the previous platform because of the uh, small, physically small CPU memory, all that mm -hmm. fun stuff, uh, it couldn't run a full Puppet Master daemon on it. Um, with this new expansion expansion of the, of the platform itself, uh, are you able to run Puppet Master and things like that on it? I haven't even tried, but I imagine you could. Yeah. I mean, there's other tools you could run on this platform, like iPerf or something. Mm -hmm. You can get you know information out of that and use it as an autonomous tool that lives outside of your your primary production or management land because you can have a full cellular network. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that's an upgrade on this product is the, uh, the Gig E and the SFP ports. We've had customers that wanted fiber because they didn't want copper between racks and rows, either top of rack or end of row solution. Um, so everyone has asked for SFP ports to eliminate the need for copper. So we have those on this unit as well. Um, that combined with the LTE makes it a really cool platform. And moving ahead, it's not your granddad's terminal server. <laughs> it may function in some of the same ways, but it has a lot more built into it. And it also has um, a whole runbook of uh, what we call runbook automation. There's a lot of uh, escalating and protracted alerts you can build off it from the devices it's connected to, either Wi-Fi or serial, or even over uh, gigabit or SFP. Yes. So I'm a big fan of blue USB ports. What are the are those USB three, and what are they designed for? They are USB 3, and they're designed for connectivity to USB dongles for other cellular adapters. Um, they're also for external storage, okay. USB connections, and Cisco console ports. Currently, we have a cap, I believe, at two per uh, USB bus. OK, so, so no hanging a big hub off of them. Can we power hop off this? Not sure. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't tested that. <laughs> That's an untested feature, but I think we probably can using it. It's got a USB 3 chipset. Yeah, it could be interesting to hang a powered hub off of it. And you know, you could do four, six, seven uh, USB dongles. And could probably drive a fair amount of the traffic through the USB as opposed to USB 2. Or and what board. type of dongles would you really like to connect um, to? I'm just, I'm just thinking like a, you know, a Rocket 4G or any of the okay. carriers, uh, LG or LG, LTE cards. Yeah, that, that's one good thing to bring up. So we embed the LTE 4G stuff into our products because they have a longer enterprise life cycle than the dongles. Mm -hmm. Dongles last like 12 months if they're lucky, they're already off the market. Um, so with the enterprise level support, you got a four year warranty and you can put it into your enterprise class business and you're ensured that you're gonna have service and support for four years or longer. Okay. Um, we do accept dongles into all of our products and we try to stay on top of it and have one, at least one certified with the North American carriers and then worldwide as well. But they really do come in and out of service with companies like AT&T and Verizon every 12 months. And a lot of the companies that buy those dongles buy them directly from the carrier. So we stay on top of it as best as we can to keep the latest support for those external dongles as well. Cool. Um, so beyond console management, we give you the ability to do uh, environmental monitoring and sensor management. We have a small adapter that fits onto one of these serial ports called an EMD 5000 that provides temperature and humidity sensing as well as providing two digital IOs for um, they're normally closed, normally open, close, close contacts, five volt, for water leak detection, smoke, fire, vibration, and door contact sensors. And that's a wired solution. The access point does give you the ability to leverage the new cool wireless AXA, wireless sensors that are available in the market. Um, so we've had requests for that, SFP, LTE, more grunt into one package. Now this, this can live in a rack, 
can live in a, in a row. Um, uh, you yeah. mentioned before we started, you know, sir, when you kind of walked in, uh, some of these uh, uh, battery attached remote sensors. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of expand a little bit on those, the kind of the ecosystem around the product? Do you remember the name of the company? We, or even the function of what they do? Right? Mm -hmm. No, nah, it, was, it was something else. It was another company out of uh, Sandy, Utah that um, another one of the founders of our company was familiar with. There's small battery powered sensors that are available now for you know, under $100. And they have these long term batteries in them that need to be replaced once every two years. And they'll, they'll check every 60 seconds. Um, I can get you a link to some of them. But they've been more, they actually have them down at Walmart. Doesn't mess wireless, but yeah. Like Walmart level, even for your home, they have some of these Wi Fi. Okay. These Wi Fi sensors that are Fresh just happens to be next to the Sun and the Amazon data centers and everyone else who's down at Sandy. Yeah. So happens to be like, hey, we'll make one and maybe get some customers. Crestron? <laughs> yeah. What's that? Crestron? Is that the company? No, it was actually, it was, jeez, uh, I, I can't believe I forgot. But Crestron, if they make Wi Fi sensors, we can attach to them. Maybe Monit? What's that? Monit? It is Monit. You're right. We're, we're, like, we're Googling, we're not yeah. smart. We're just... <laughs> <laughs> That's what all of IT support is, right? Just Google it. Whoever's quickest to the answer is the best. I'm oh, sorry. Secret. Secret must not be done. <laughs> so the, it's, a, it's not your dad, your granddad's terminal server, right? But if you have a large amount of these and you have a big deployment, whether it's distributed and you're trying to access it over all LTE, or if it's local and you're trying to do it over the same uh, LAN segments, managing console ports is a pain. Mm -hmm. Being able to access them quickly is one of the solutions that we do with our centralized management platform. So we have centralized management that allows for granular access to the serial ports, um, centralized pass-through for web shell for people to get in and access serial ports, filter by attributes, so name, rack, location, uh, click to connect through an easy to use web interface. Um, single sign-on, things like that are really important. We actually uh, built in a for customers that really want to support the dial-in solutions, we built in a dial pool into our centralized management platform, which is also new. So if you have a MacBook or something that doesn't have a modem, you can uh, IPsec tunnel into your data center, hop on this thing, and then grab a modem and dial outbound. So it allows you to centralize POTS line still and not have to worry about supporting that for locations that are buried into a bunker that have a, a POTS line. Um, let's see, any other questions at this time? Sure. Um, do you have anything in place or in the plans for managing these in bulk? Like if I have, say, a large colo yeah. and have one of them each row, and I have 50 rows or whatever. Yeah, well, it's, it's based on an XML config file. You can copy and paste the config commands, so you can do a, a dump of the config commands and send them back over in clear text or in a script okay. uh, over the console port. Uh, that's the quickest way to cookie cutter them is what we've seen a lot of integrators do as well that deploy into hundreds of locations. People like CDW, Foresight. Um, for customers to do have cookie cutter type installations, they just buzz in a simple template config and ship them out. Okay, so, and how about access and aggregation for them? Like that's the, done through centralized management. Okay. So these devices have the ability to call home to a central management platform, as we call it Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. uh, that's either in a VMware appliance or a hardware appliance, and. We found a lot of the time the network guys and the server guys live in different silos. And the server guys don't want to provide a VM for the network guys, so we have a hardware appliance to serve uh, both needs. Uh, the device scales up to 5,000 open gear appliances to manage all of those. Um, granular user permissioning, monitoring, alerting, some centralized config management and access and control. Uh, that's an area where we're we're under development for further config management, but we can lock out users, upgrade firmware, uh, and give give access immediately to the, the different console ports. Yeah. So one question, I mean, this might be totally insane, I'm probably stupid for bringing this up on video. Uh, so I asked about the Puppet Master uh, yeah. example. Um, one use case that uh, started to come real in my world is uh, publish your configurations, your system configurations, to a Git repo or okay. a resource code repository. Um, that gets pulled down um, or subscribed to by a puppet server, a puppet master server, and then your your um, your host within your infrastructure that's in the little pod or whatnot subscribe to that, and that's where you push down policy. Uh, network configuration, uh, network device configuration is probably the biggest pain in the rear. We've had a discussion about this earlier today, as I mean, network manufacturers don't want to open up puppet support or it's hard to do, so they don't do it. Um, is there ability if a configure 
is our ability to basically pipeline a configuration and assign it to one of the console ports. So if we know the device is plugged in the console port, to be able to stream that, that derived config down, down it through your, out your device. I'm sure there's a way to script that. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, the port's open, and you can assign it, and it's assignable and, and available via centralized proxy remotely as well. Yeah. So I mean, you, you could have both local access and then centralized access to that same port. So you're thinking, what's the solution for a vendor that doesn't support public agents? Well, no. So there's already, if you look at it with, with Puppet and similar with Chef, um, you, you define your configuration management database effectively. The policy is what you want to create, and effectively there's an interpreter that you publish to. Um, the Puppet NetDev stuff, you end up putting a, a, effectively a proxy device, which translates that and gets it on the actual switch rather than not. Um, but I was kind of thinking out loud of the capability of, since you have direct console access, it gets around some of the challenges of uh, not, not being able to instantiate a service, right? You know, base configuration. Um, so maybe, you know, if your default install doesn't enable SSH for security purposes, this would let you get in and lock down the firewall or whatever before you turn on SSH. E well, exactly. Or even base switch configuration. Mm -hmm. then yeah. Little hacks in the past for some other data centers in Sandy. Yeah, so we can detect when a serial port's been plugged in. Yeah. Um, you could then query the host name of it and yeah. then send over a config if you wanted to. You Pull the config. Yeah. 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 So in, as you know, scripting via SSH is always problematic. And it's a pain in the rear. Yeah. yeah. Just that we have locks down the exact. So the, it's an interesting way to get around that, that solution so, for that problem. So, yeah. I'm sorry about derailing. No, 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 you're, you're not. I'm, just, I'm, I'm thinking about sending the config file over the serial console port. Um, effectively pipe it into an expect script. So you use expect for whatever uh, variant of hardware that you I have. They were going to do character buffering at all to not overrun the UART on the Cisco device. Yeah. Um, expect handles that full speed. Okay. Yeah, because it's saying send this, I expect this back. It's kind of self buffering, I might say. And then to just pipe in the different. Uh, I was caught the, the different the diffs for the files that you need to apply, or just reapply the entire file. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a great hack, but it's a way of solving a problem that is not solvable right now, which is always sneak. That's you know, it's called a what? A sneak? No, that's oh. always neat. Oh, I thought you said something else. To be, <laughs> solve, to be able to solve a problem that you can solve right now, the device. Yeah. It's besides so. just running a Linux router or switch, which. Cisco last week, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> Save that for later. So how we elevate this game is with the cellular component. And we're really the only vendor who embeds it, does the certification process, and goes through all of this. There may be other competitors that, that we had out there. We kind of passed them a few years ago. Um, they only do support the dongles. And what makes that different is that you, know, you do have a full life cycle of the product. and you bolt it into a customer premise equipment, like the four port is great for network managed service providers doing customer premise equipment, rebooting a PDU, monitoring a UPS system. And the carriers these days have plans that are low as, uh, for the average Joe, $5 per month per site, and that includes private IPs. So you're not out there and part of the rest of the world. Well, uh, AT&T and Verizon give you your own private IPs. It's a VRF directly into your own VLAN, so you're not, you're not exposing your equipment to your console ports or our equipment to the internet, which is um, the I guess the baseline of securing these devices and securing connectivity for the console ports. We have customers that run three, four, six hundred different sites. We've seen them get down in the price range into 80 cents per site per month for one meg data plans. It's pool data plans. So 600 meg, the devices are only up and, and available when needed. Uh, there's a couple different trigger points to do that. You can do that with text messaging, have it drop the connection after a timeout script, doesn't see any uh, traffic on an interface. Uh, it'll fail over automatically based on a ping check. So there's several different mechanisms that will bring the device, uh, the radio up to high signal and start transmitting data. We do support dynamic PNS, static IP, things like that. But um, for any type of install of fiber above, I'd recommend private IP services because they're so cheap and so available these days. Do you have a single port, single port cellular option? Just a four port is the lowest we go. It's this one right here. And it's 675, so it's it's pretty affordable, you know? Yeah, yeah, I saw it. I just, one of the uh, things that came out on, on Twitter maybe a month and a half ago or so was a friend that was saying he needed to have the ability to have a console on mesh APs. Yeah. 
He's got mesh APs located all throughout the, the yard for where vehicles are parking mm -hmm. or trailers or whatnot. And you need to be able to do a console into those because if the mesh goes down, obviously it's dead in the water. So I did suggest to him to look at the, the open gear product, but at four ports, you know, we don't need that. We just need a single, you know, like a single port with the cellular on it. And it'd, even, it'd be great if it, had a, if it was solar power too. A little better. So, <laughs> I know I'm going through the whole big, huge wish list, but it's kind of it's an interesting market. Or, or a DC power input on it. Just yeah, put your own solar panel on it. Yeah. And just at a lower cost, you know, per port. Because that's solar. something that for municipalities that are doing mesh networking for the entire cities or the entire areas, you know, that could be a, an interesting market that you could be looking that, that, that nobody has a solution for right yeah. now. Yeah. Except Meraki, right? Well, even if a Meraki goes down, Meraki's down. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can't get to the bridge, you can't get to the mesh node, you can't get to the mesh node, it doesn't matter. The, the you see, it's real, a real cheap. The problem is that a you know, one port wouldn't cost much less than a full port. Right. You see, that's also kind of the, you know, people don't want to have all those extra little parts just yeah. sitting there that somebody could maybe lock off. Well, if you could certainly do it, it just wouldn't be a lot cheaper. You could doctor up a decal and block off the other ports. Or <laughs> J45 <laughs> 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 connector. Uh, it's, it is a good product. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. a good use case. Yeah. And we do have models that um, we have about 160 different products, and uh, they are available with a DC power on both the rack mount units and smaller units with a little green connector block that's usually found on the side here. The other one had it in the back. But it does, uh, it's 12 volt power, so you can, you can hook up uh, a solar panel if you want to. You do. Yeah, I'm just trying to help you guys push more boxes. <laughs> and when you start marketing that and it takes off, let it know. <laughs> well, I, I would kind of second his, uh, his idea there because uh, not just in, in municipal, uh, but also uh, in manufacturing. You know, we have a lot of warehouses where, uh, you know, we're, we need to keep track of the trucks um, and, or, and the trailers and where they're at and different things along those lines. And so we have uh, we have a lot of places where we have, uh, you know, the mesh networks on uh, you know, it's on, basically on your light bulbs, uh, yep. and so if, if we can get access to that to resolve issues and troubleshoot issues, it, it it's that that's huge. Um, you know, and that that that's the difference between a uh, system being down for you know a, a few minutes and a system being down for maybe a day if if, if a lift's not available. What would be the the price range where that would be? I mean, acceptable. I would think, you know, it's one of those things, it's so, it's so specific, I would think, you know, a few hundred dollars, you know. Um, yeah, I'd say if, you, if you're at the 200 mark, yeah. that's probably what most people would be acceptable to add on to. I mean, grand scheme of things, the mesh AP is, what, 5K list, so. It, it's a true book, but even in manufacturing where you're doing like automated kind of vehicles through an unmanned facility, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have guys to go respond to that, and you've already got a you know, even a five to a thousand dollar, five hundred to a thousand dollar AD or whatever, you know, two hundred bucks just makes it you can get connectivity up to the server board. Yeah. 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 Well, I've, I've got a number of customers that have, um, you know, s small, small remote sites, right? It might be just VPN connected, an ASA 505 type, you know, just mm -hmm. a small firewall, a couple of ports, right? So if they spent five hundred bucks total to put in the, the infrastructure for the site, right? Firewall switch everything, seven hundred bucks for Remote console is kind of a tough sell, but at the same time, those are the sites that need it most. Mm -hmm. Those are the sites that yeah. don't have IT support on right. there, right? So something that was in the 200, 250 range, that's probably something that would be an easier sell to just say, you know, if, if you're building the site out, you just include this too, right? Yeah. Versus, okay, you know, here, here's your $500 firewall and here's your $700 things we can manage your remotely. Yeah. That's good feedback. It would be a, because I would love to get, you know, the remote console out at, at a lot of those customers have small sites like that because they call and then you got to try to talk whoever happens to be there through putting the laptop on a console if they have a console oh, port. Oh, on poles too. That even makes it more difficult yeah. to access. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or right. ceilings and you got to get a scissor lift or something to go find oh, yeah. it. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have Wi-Fi only models? We do. We yes. do three port with Wi-Fi. I believe they're 475. I run several theaters and I have APs hanging off of catwalks. So I can't get to those all the time either. And it would be the same thing as the mesh, but yeah. I don't need the cellular. I just need to connect back to my network. Yeah, we do, we do have those um, Wi-Fi. We have, like I said, about 160 different products, and most of them are in this, this form factor here in the, the smaller count. Uh, these are 8, 16, 32, and 48. So 
the variants are dual DC or AC with or without cellular is an AT&T or Verizon or is the rest of the world. But these guys also are available in high temp models as well. So if you want to hang them on a pole in a NEMA enclosure, uh, we have solutions for that too for high temp environments. I love those. Things. So I noticed on that one, um, is, is it just the dry contacts you have on the side there or is that GPI where you can pull it up and pull it down? We, we actually do have one that's a Dash I version which is a, has two uh, 30 volt uh, contacts that can drive relays. Two 5 okay. volt and then two 30 volt. Okay. To drive relays. You can open a gate or a door or you know something right. else. Okay. Going back a second, how many products did you say you have? 160, I think, but we're just wow. adding in a lot more. So this model uh, will bring up a skew count to even a, a higher higher level. So we do have quite a bit of a selection to choose from. Yeah, I just want to make sure I heard that right. Yeah. That's a yeah. lot of products. What, what, what product, how many product lines do you have? I mean, uh, well, four or five. We have the 7200, the 4200, the 5500, which is the larger model around here, and then the 5000, and then the SD. So we have five product families, and then centralized management. So we have five categories, okay. central management. Some of the products um, over the next year, year or two, may find themselves uh, changing or evolving into, or consolidating into different product lines. Right. We've, we've had some of the same product lines for eight years now, and uh, technology moves on, so, so do our products. What would you say 160, you're talking, I mean, we have this with 16, 32, 48, B92, 4 so it's just... Multiply yeah. for dual DC, yeah. multiply for AT&T, Verizon models, because they're separate modules, and then rest of the world modules, and it just the SKU count grows and yeah. grows, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, but so the, the product families are, and the, the, the smaller one that you got around here is available with and without environmental sensors as well, and then Verizon, AT&T, and all the other factors, so... Um, we also offer 48 volt DC power supplies for the small ones, or you can direct wire directly into the unit too. Uh, the DC power supplies we have are pretty cool, especially in these, these big units. They, uh, they can sense line power, temperature, uh, load, and they can feedback that data. So if anyone has a 48 volt environment, we can provide monitoring of the circuits as well that are, that are connected to it. So what's, what's, you clearly don't have shelves of 160 skews sitting around ready to pull them. Should the customer try it. Right. You, you assemble them as order. What's the lead time on the product? Product is in stock and available. Is it, it's so it's you all have, in you have 160 oh, yeah. SKUs sitting on the shelf. Yeah, it's, it's a matter of switching out the module. So it's you know it's the same build of the product, but it's an AT&T module or a Verizon, or it's bundled with a 48 volt power supply. So that that's what makes those different model numbers 160. Okay. You know, so I suppose we could distill it down to maybe 40 or 50 different core products that have different variants that change their model number. Kind of makes you want to rip into one of these and see. Kind of does. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> these, these ports available on the side, how accessible are they? How, I mean, we, we have access to the Linux yeah. core. We can you, you have root access. Uh, we have a full SDK available. You can roll your own firmware. Um, runs on UC Linux. And it's such a widely supported uh, embedded Linux operating system. So. The, the green connector blocks on the side, there's a terminal connector on the model that does include it. It's like a $25 premium. And you have the screw down terminal, and it's fully accessible for you to do normally open, normally closed monitor. Okay. You said it's 5 volt, 30 volt? Yeah, and one, it, it's 5 volt on all the models. There's one that's a dash I, which is an industrial model that lives at a higher, has an extended temperature range uh, that does have the, the 30 volt for, for driving relays. So if we have access to be able to modify our and everything, <coughs> if we break it, what's your support? You know, people ask that. It's funny that our support, our support load isn't heavy with people hacking these and, and tweaking it and breaking it. This is the group that's going to be together. And the funny thing is, usually you guys figure it out yourselves. You know, I don't know if it's pride or you don't want to call support, but we don't ever hear from the guys that, that take these things apart and strip them down and build their own stuff. You know, we hear from more of the beginner users that are, you know, struggling with setup and kind of adopting the technology for the first time. So we don't have a support overload of, of people. It's not so much of a, a support overload, it's more of a, if we break it because we're stupid and did that, will you walk us through getting it back yeah, up we'll to run into a, a good state again? Or Yeah, there's magic reset buttons hidden on here, and you can yeah, <laughs> flash over, <laughs> recovery image, and get it back yeah, up yeah, and yeah, running. Yeah, that's, that's, that's that's what what I gotta right. say, I've used Open Gear in one of my places. Um, <laughs> <laughs> their support's great. I mean, it, it's bar none great. It, it's what you expect. Nice, thank you. Hey, you mentioned high temp. What about extreme low temp? 
Uh, got a couple of the Canadian in Canada. Got a couple of sites that are uh, technology way up there as far as. And how does it put up with polar bears? Is it yeah. uh, <laughs> and flying squirrels? We have and also sites that aren't backed up by uh, any kind of cellular satellite. Kind of you can feed satellite into one of the alternate Ethernet ports on any of the devices and use it as a failover and bridge bond it. Um, what we support to the Dash I models is negative 35 Celsius or negative 31 Fahrenheit. Yeah, just put it in a NEMA enclosure with the heater and call it good. Uh, here's a grocery. Yeah. So these two smaller ones are available. The, the mid size, the 5500 and the 5000, are both available with extended temperature. And if you guys are interested, um, after the networking field day, Open Gear presented at networking field day, and a bunch of the delegates actually did compile their own firmware and did some pretty, well, some exploring on the system. So uh, if you want, I can tweet out the link to some of their blog posts. Uh, Chris Margette, who unfortunately is not here, uh, but uh, I'm sure that he would love to hear from you guys about his experiences with that because he did a whole lot with the Open Gear box.